So this is chapter 16. We're going to be talking about how do we regulate gene expression. So here are the learning objectives again. Be sure you can answer all of them. The main focus should be on number five though as this covers the majority of the lecture. So here's our first learning objective, knowing the mechanism for regulating gene expression in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So you should have a good idea of the main differences between the two. This would be a good slide to memorize. Um, so we'll go through a couple of these. So in prokaryotes, regulation of gene expression mainly happens at the level of initiation, whereas in eukaryotes, gene regulation occurs at several different levels. Um, one of our exam questions was actually the fourth bullet. So knowing that in prokaryotes, each operon is under control of a single promoter. And then repressors bind to promoters to inhibit RNA polymerase binding, which we'll talk about later. And then activators, right? They activate or facilitate RNA polymerase binding to the repressor. So this is just a picture of a prokaryote, so it, it will give you a visual representation of what we'll be talking about. So in a prokaryote, there are no membrane-bound organelles like in eukaryotes. Uh, the DNA is circular, as you can see. And then the part where you see transcription occurring, that is the operon, which we'll be talking uh, about soon. So transcription and translation can occur simultaneously in prokaryotes, but then remember transcription happens before translation in eukaryotes. And also a key thing about prokaryotes is there is no nucleus. So I highly recommend you go on the Facebook group page and pull up the biochem videos for chapter 16. Try to watch them so you can have a visual understanding before you go into the lecture and then come back. So an operon, as I mentioned in the previous slide, is a part on the DNA where it has all these structural genes which code for proteins. So if you look, starting from the top of the picture, you're going to have a DNA strand, and let's say a section of that is the operon. Every operon is going to have a promoter, which is the place where your DNA polymerase, or I'm sorry, RNA polymerase is going to bind and then make your mRNA strand. And then we know from the previous chapter, mRNA goes through translation to make your protein. So again, you have your operon on the DNA. The operon has a promoter region where RNA polymerase will bind to and then make your mRNA strand. Then the mRNA strand is going to go through translation and you're going to make your proteins. So this slide is talking about repressors and how they regulate operons. So in the blue, we have DNA. That part is our operon. Remember, all operons have a promoter region where RNA polymerase will bind to it and make mRNA. And you'll see that this purple-shaped thing called a repressor is bound to the operator. So you can think of the repressor as an on and off switch. If the repressor is bound to the operator, that means transcription can occur. So just think of the name itself, repressor represses things, so it inhibits it. So anytime the repressor is bound on the operator, no transcription occurs, which means no proteins can be made through translation. So repressors inhibit transcription. So in the previous two slides, we talked about learning objective two, which is just understanding and knowing regulation of operons. Now we're moving to learning objective three, describing the transcriptional regulatory processes in prokaryotes. And the first one we start off with is induction. So just think of induction as admitting or introducing something. So induction is going to involve small molecules called inducers, which are going to stimulate expression of the operon by binding to the repressor. So basically, it's going to start your transcription. So here, we talk about induction. So earlier, we talked about the repressor being a on and off switch. So if the repressor is bound to your DNA, then there is no transcription occurring. So how do we get the repressor off if we want to activate the operon? So well, something called an inducer, which is that green molecule, will bind to your repressor. And as soon as it binds to the repressor, it's going to inactivate it. So now that your repressor is off, RNA polymerase can bind to that promoter region, and it's going to start transcription. And then transcription will follow, translation will come, and then you'll make your proteins. 
So repressor on means no transcription. Inducer will make your repressor inactive, thereby stimulating transcription. So again, if you haven't watched those videos that I posted on the Facebook group page, highly recommend you watch the one with the LAC operon. So here we have a DNA strand in blue at the top. You have the promoter region where your RNA polymerase will bind, and then you have your structural genes. So depending on what type of gene it is, it's going to make a different protein. So once your RNA polymerase binds to the promoter region, it's going to make your mRNA strand, and then once it goes through translation, you're going to make certain proteins. So the Z gene makes beta-galactosidase, your Y gene makes permease, and your A gene makes transacetylase. So I would definitely know that the Z gene is beta-galactosidase, Y gene is permease, A gene is transacetylase. And no also know their function. So beta-galactosidase, it breaks down lactose into glucose and galactose. Permease transports lactose into the cell, and then transacetylase acetylates beta-galactosidases. So still on learning objective three, the second thing we talk about is repression. So the repressor is inactive until a small molecule called the co-repressor binds to the repressor, activating it. So here we have an inactive repressor. So let's say that the inducer bound to the repressor and made it inactive. How do we make that repressor active again so that we can turn off transcription? Well, you need something called a co-repressor. So let's say we have an inactive repressor. The co-repressor can bind to the inactive repressor and make it an active repressor. As soon as the repressor is active, it can now bind to your DNA operon area, and then transcription will be inhibited. So the next one is positive control, activator proteins that facilitate RNA polymerase binding. So you've seen this picture before. Pay attention to the top left box talking about activators. And these are just going to be proteins that are going to facilitate the binding of RNA polymerase. So the faster RNA polymerase binds to the promoter region, the faster you can make mRNA. So those are what activators are. So next we have catabolic repression. So basically when we have the presence or absence of glucose, it's going to affect transcription in some sort of way. So this slide is just telling you about the effects that glucose has on the lac operon. So if we have an increase of glucose in the body, then no transcription occurs. So if we have glucose, no transcription occurs. If we don't have glucose, then the inducer, remember we talked about inducers earlier? The inducer allolactose is going to bind to the repressor. And remember what happens when an inducer binds to the repressor? It makes it inactive. And now that your repressor is inactive, your RNA polymerase can bind to the promoter and begin transcription. So another thing they talk about is cyclic AMP and CRP. So if you notice the arrows, if glucose is high, CAMP is low. But if we don't have glucose, CAMP is high, and what it does is it binds to CRP, and together they bind to the promoter region, and they stimulate the binding of RNA polymerase. So if they stimulate the binding of RNA polymerase, then transcription is going to be stimulated. So just remember, if glucose is present, no transcription occurs. But if glucose is absent, then your inducer allolactose will bind to the repressor. Now your repressor is inactive, and then cyclic AMP and CRP will bind together, and they're going to stimulate the binding of RNA polymerase. So this slide is telling you the same thing, but in the absence of glucose, which we already talked about. So in the absence of glucose, remember the cyclic AMP forms the complex with the CRP and the CAMP-CRP complex will stimulate the binding of RNA polymerase. So the last 
transcriptional regulatory process is called attenuation, and that's a process that interrupts transcription after it has already begun. And then you'll notice in the parentheses, and pay attention to these because these will be tested on if you ask about attenuation, tryptophan, histidine, leucine, phenylalanine, and threonine operons are regulated by attenuation. So definitely know those amino acids are affected by attenuation. So here we talk about attenuation of the trip operon. So remember, attenuation is the process that interrupts transcription after it has been initiated. And also, don't forget your other amino acids that are regulated by attenuation shown on the previous slide. So histidine, leucine, phenylalanine, and threonine are all operons that are regulated by attenuation. So when tryptophan levels are low, a 2 to 3 loop is going to form and that 2 to 3 loop is going to stop your ribosome or it's going to stall it and then transcription is going to continue so the reason we stall our ribosome is because we don't have enough trip tRNA because tryptophan levels are low so once we get enough trip tRNA your ribosome is going to continue to go through transcription so trip levels are low 2 to 3 loop will form and that's going to stall your ribosome until it gets enough trip tRNA to proceed with transcription. On the other hand, high levels of tryptophan attenuate transcription. So that's shown on the bottom. If you have high levels of tryptophan, a 3 to 4 loop is going to form, and that 3 to 4 loop is actually a termination signal. So with high levels of tryptophan, transcription is going so fast that it's going to pass that 2 to 3 loop and go straight to a termination signal. So low levels of tryptophan, ribosome stalls, and trans transcription continues, but high levels of tryptophan, you're going to move transcription very rapidly and terminate at the 3 to 4 loop. So here's learning objective 4, knowing the difference in genomic construction in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So this would be a very good slide to memorize. The colored bullets are the differences but still pay attention to the ones that are not bulleted. He could ask a question where he says, in prokaryotes, where do you find ribosomes? So ribosomes would be found in the cytoplasm. So just depending on how he asked the question, he might ask you a difference between the two, or he just might ask you a uh, characteristic of prokaryotes. So this is just a recap, um, prokaryotic cell versus eukaryotic cell. Key difference is that prokaryotic cells don't have membrane-bound organelles, they don't have a nucleus, and transcription and translation occur simultaneously in prokaryotes. So on this slide is just talking briefly about eukaryotes and how gene expression occurs on multiple levels. So some of those are DNA in the chromosome, transcription primarily through transcription factors, processing of transcript, initiation of translation and stability of mRNA. His main focus, however, is on the next slide. So learning objective five is a very important objective. Most of his exam questions will probably come from this, so definitely know them well. We'll start off with gene alteration. So gene alteration includes several different factors, and the first one we're talking about is chromatin remodeling. So he's not going to go in depth with the mechanisms or anything like that. You just have to know that chromatin remodeling, an example of chromatin remodeling, is histone acetylation. So basically, we're adding an acetyl group to a histone. And that, if you look at the very bottom right, removes a positive charge from uh, lysine. And that's going to reduce the electrostatic interactions between histones and DNA, making it easier for DNA to unwind. So he focuses mainly on number one, chromatin remodeling, which we just talked about, and gene rearrangement, but you should know that all five of these fall under gene alteration. Several of his questions will just be asking, okay, a regulatory process in eukaryotes is gene alteration. These include the following. So that would be chromatin remodeling, which is just acetylating a histone, methylation of DNA, so that's just adding a methyl group to the cytosine residues, gene amplification, gene deletions, and gene rearrangement. So definitely know and practice this 
that these fives are all examples of gene alteration. So number five of gene alteration was rearrangement. So what you need to know from here is that segments of DNA can move from one location to another by recombination. And the example they show here is an antibody. And you'll see it has all these different regions, the V gene, B gene, and J gene. All these sequences can go through recombination and combine together to make some sort of new DNA. So we covered gene alteration. Remember there were five things that covered gene alteration, so just be able to go over all of those before you move on to the next one. After you've completed gene alteration, the next one is transcriptional control. So this is just regulation at the level of transcription. And the first one we're going to talk about are gene-specific regulatory proteins. So these are the gene regulatory proteins. If you look at the top right, you see in pink regulatory DNA binding proteins, also known as specific transcription factors. They can be either activators or repressors, and we'll talk about those in the upcoming slides, but they interact with the general transcription factors, which we talked about before in the last exam, and they're going to have some effect on transcription. So some of those specific transcription factors that we talked about in the previous slide can be hormone receptors. So one of the hormone receptors is the steroid hormone, which we'll talk about more in the next slide. Uh, there's not really much that he will test you on from here at all, so don't worry too much about this slide. So it's unlikely that he's going to test on the mechanisms he did in for our test, just knowing that cortisol is a steroid hormone and that Remember, transcription factors can be hormone receptors, and all of that falls under transcriptional control. Should be good enough for the test. But if you do want to go through this mechanism, it's basically telling you that your steroid hormone is cortisol. And remember from the picture a few slides back, hormone receptors can bind to co-activators. Co-activators are going to stimulate your basal transcription complex, and that's going to increase or stimulate transcription. So the key thing, again, to remember from the slide is that cortisol is a steroid hormone, transcription factors can be hormone receptors, and all of this falls under transcriptional control. So in addition to cortisol being a hormone receptor, we have another hormone receptor called thyroid hormone, and this is also going to initiate transcription. So the big picture is really knowing that transcription factors can be hormone receptors. There's two of them that we talked about, which is cortisol and thyroid hormone, and all of these fall under transcriptional control. He's unlikely to test these mechanisms, but still be sure to read them. I don't know if he's changed his questions, um, but really, key points is that your hormone receptors are going to stimulate transcription. So number three, under transcriptional control, is the structure of DNA binding proteins. So there's several different structural motifs that have been characterized for specific transcription factors. Zinc fingers is one of them. You don't have to know the structure or anything in detail. Pay more attention to the next slide coming up. So again, nothing too detailed, just knowing what are examples of DNA binding proteins. So here you have four examples of DNA binding proteins, zinc fingers, leucine zippers, helix turn helix, and helix loop helix. So know that all four of these are examples of DNA binding proteins, but also pay attention to what he wrote. He says all of these DNA binding proteins contain an alpha helix that binds to the major or minor group in DNA. All right, so four and five, regulation of transcription factors and then multiple regulators of promoters. So here it's just saying that the same transcription factor can activate transcription of many different genes if the gene contains a common response element. So here we have a regulatory protein, and this regulatory protein stimulates transcriptions of gene A and B. Both of them have a common DNA regulatory sequence. So the protein product of gene B is actually a transcriptional activator, which in turn stimulates transcriptions of gene E, F, and G. So a key thing to know from here is that 
you can activate a whole set of genes by a single inducer. So this talks about the PEP-CK gene, and the key thing to know from here is that PEP-CK is stimulated by glucagon, but inhibited by insulin. So that's really all you have to know. So what stimulates the synthesis of PEP-CK is glucagon, and what inhibits synthesis of PEP-CK is insulin. So as you can see, we're still on the same learning objective, and you can see that it takes a majority of his lecture. So we covered gene alteration, we covered transcriptional control, now we're moving on to post-transcriptional control. So the first thing we're going to talk about is alternative splicing and polyadenylation. So if you remember from the previous exam, before it can become a mature mRNA, it has to go through splicing to remove any introns. So here is just showing alternative splicing. We remember we add the cap to the 5' prime end, and then we also add the poly A tail. So not too much to know from this slide, just knowing that alternative splicing and polyadenylation is an example of post-transcriptional control. So next one we talk about is RNA editing. So here is an example of RNA editing. We have the apoprotein B gene. And depending if it goes through the liver or if it goes through the intestine, it's going to make a certain amount of proteins. So if it goes through the liver, it's going to make more amino acids than if it were to go through the intestine. So that's the key thing to pay attention to. In the liver, apoprotein B gene is going to make 4,500 amino acids. In the intestine, it's going to make a smaller amount, about 2,100 amino acids. And again, RNA editing is an example of post-transcriptional control. So here we talk about microRNA, also known as meRNA, so I would note both for the tests. And again, the main thing to know is that it induces degradation of a target mRNA, or it blocks the translation of the target mRNA. So you don't need to pay too much attention to the mechanism, just again, the font at the very bottom, and then knowing that it's an example of post-transcriptional control. So after transcription is translation. So now we're going to be talking about translational control. So here we're talking about an example of regulation of initiation for translation. So here it says heme prevents inactivation of EIF2. So if you're not sure what EIF2 is, go back to chapter 15, slide 18, where we talk about it. So EIF2 is eukaryotic initiation factor 2. Remember it bound to the MET tRNA and it formed a complex and then that's going to form a complex with the 40S ribosome and the EIF3. So go back to that chapter 15, slide 18 if you don't remember talking about that. Basically this slide talks about heme prevents the inactivation of EIF2. So if heme is present, EIF2 will remain active and then it can bind to MET tRNA. If heme isn't there, then a kinase could phosphorylate it and inactivate it. So heme present means EIF2 is active. If heme isn't present, then the kinase will phosphorylate it and make it inactive, thereby inhibiting initiation of translation. So here's another example of regulation of initiation of translation. So here we have mRNA, and you see this molecule that's bound to it. So the mRNA for ferritin has an iron response element that's known as IRE. When IRE, binding protein, doesn't have bound iron, it binds to IRE, which prevents translation. But if we do have iron, then it's going to cause IREBP to dissociate, and then mRNA can be translated. So the mechanism is not too important to understand just knowing that this is an example of another way to regulate initiation of translation and also knowing the previous example how heme prevents inactivation of EIF2. So done talking about translational control, now we talk about post-translational control. So here we talk about regulation of degradation of mRNA. So that should be a key thing you focus on. The regulation of degradation of mRNA is an example of post-translational control. Even 
test us on the mechanism, but I would still advise you to look through it and try to understand it. So basically the mRNA, if bound to the IRBP and the IRE that we learned earlier, uh, the, if it's bound to it, then degradation is not going to occur. But if we have high iron, that causes those yellow molecules to dissociate, and then your mRNA is going to be rapidly degraded, and that prevents the synthesis of transferrin receptors. So here's an FYI slide. He didn't test this for us, but you never know. Basically, it's saying that oxalate levels, so that's C2O4, can lead to autism or iron deficiency anemia. But it's saying that carbonate is the preferred binding partner in the iron loading process. So that's how they form the human transferrin carbonate complex. So here's just a recap of your learning objectives. Number four is the longest one, so pay attention to that most. So here's your clinical correlation describing the mechanism of drug resistance with using methotrexate. So methotrexate is an anti-cancer drug. It works by inhibiting dihydrofolate reductase, which is something these cancer cells need to go through DNA synthesis. But it's saying that sometimes cancer cells that divide very rapidly, if treated with methotrexate, the methotrexate actually amplifies the gene dihydrofolate reductase. So this sort of has an opposite effect, and that causes more and more cells to form. So it's saying that methotrexate is one mechanism by which gene amplification causes the patients to become resistant to the drug. So this is your last clinical correlation describing the two mechanisms of action by which interferon inhibits gene expression. So the first one is interferons can produce oligo A, which is an activator of ribonuclease. So this ribonuclease, or RNase, is going to degrade the mRNA, thus inhibiting synthesis of the viral proteins. So that's mechanism one, mRNA degradation. Number two is the interferon can also cause EIF2 to become phosphorylated and inactive. So if EIF2 can't bind with metTRNA, then you can't form that initiation complex. So definitely know these two mechanisms for interferons. So last but not least, your disease table. Make sure to look through these, and chapter 16 is done.